Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to Matters of Public Importance on Channel 6. I'm yours, Gail Teixeira, Chief Whip for the Parliamentary Opposition, representing the People's Progressive Party Civic and the People's Progressive Party. On this program, we shall focus on matters of public importance and bring you information and discussions on issues and matters that concern to you, the Guyanese public, every Thursday between 12.30 and 1.30 p.m. And before we get into the meat of the program, I always remind you of the numbers you can use to call in, usually after 1 o'clock, 1.10, um, 225-0010 and 225-0008. And again, I caution for the callers in that um, we've had a lot of callers trying to get in and they can't, and some people seem to get in more than once on a program. So um, I'm not going to answer uh, calls that have no number, okay, that shows up on my screen here, so that um, we need to be able, uh, with things that people sometimes say, that to be able to have to know uh, who's calling in, especially if they get us in trouble with the, <laughs> with the law. Um, Again, to remind you, the Office of the Leader of the Opposition is open on 304 Church Street, Queenstown, between New Garden and Peter Rose Streets. And we're open Monday to Friday from about 9 o'clock to 5.30, and then on Saturdays from 9.30 to about 1.30. So you're welcome to come in to meet uh, different persons there. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition is there from time to time if you wish to make appointments, and other members of Parliament and staff there to serve you, the Guyanese public, and by, by the way, we're not interested in who you voted for, but we're interested in being able to make representation on your behalf, or if you just want to come in and ask and talk politics, what's going on. So you're welcome. We also have geographic MPs that have their days uh, in different regions. And to remind you, Free Freedom Radio is still functioning, uh, FM 91.1 Demerara, 90.5 Burbies, and 90.7 Essequibo. All sorts of chat programs, call-in programs, education programs, women's programs. You're welcome to come on board and to listen to our programs that go until the evening. Well, the last few weeks we've been talking about the flood and the rain, and that is affecting every single region in Guyana, and uh, farmers and uh, residents, particularly in Region 8, where over 50 houses were washed away, and the, the lack of uh, government presence and lack of government response to the difficulties that people are, are facing. I said the last time that the government was AWOL, A-W-O-L, with only a few chosen pre-arranged photo shots for, uh, with the president, uh, with the prime minister, for example, in Minister Bulkan in Region 9, where the water was coming up. They had no boots, so they just stood on the edge and let them and watched out. Um, we also have been speaking constantly, almost every single program, on the drug shortages across the country and what I've called taking care of their own. When we spoke about the use of taxpayers' money to pay exorbitant rental of properties for certain ministers. We also learned of the July 7th sitting in response to our questions that the PhD Public Hospital Georgetown had not received approval for the request to waive or attend a board uh, procedures from the National Procurement and Tenant Administration for the award of $605 million to Ansa Macau. The minister said they had had the approval from the NTAPB and NPTAB. Um, that's why they didn't go to public tender. Well, you know, despite the ruling of the NTAB that they did not have approval for the waiver of the tender board procedures in Guyana, the public hospital Georgetown went ahead. Somebody or somebody's head has to roll on this matter. And so we continue to pursue this issue in Parliament and in the press, of course. Uh, we've talked about the old age pensioners and the change in the policy of the government. We're interested in knowing what is going on in the ground, particularly with the number of our old age pensioners. We're hearing about different issues. Please feel free to call in or to come to Church Street if you're having particular issues. And of course, this is what I call the Sword of Damocles being held over every Guyanese voter and every potential Guyanese voter's head is the appointment of the GCOM chairman. Well, we have, as I've said in the last program, shortlisted a number of the nominees from civil society and the People's Progressive Party. And we're now speaking to those persons. And I announced at the last meeting, the last uh, uh, program, that uh, one of the 10 names we had shortlisted had already rejected. They don't want to be embarrassed by the government. And as we keep saying, the appointment of the chairman of the GCOM is in accordance with the Constitution 
is critical to allaying the fears of our people that the integrity of the election machinery is and will be protected. This is a critical ingredient to trust Guyanese have in the electoral system. And we spoke last setting, uh, last program about the June 9th, 2017 um, jail fire, uh, Camp Street prison fire and jail break. Uh, and in some cases, people say jail walk out, um, which destroyed about 80% of the Georgetown prison. And at that point, when I gave the program, they said it was eight prisoners um, had escaped and we were told later it was reduced to six. Some of the identities got switched around. And so 80 hours later, we still, at that point, were unaware of what was really the truth of what's happening. And of course, one death of a prison officer and several others injured. Um, so they said there were no other deaths other than that one person, the prison officer. We expressed our condolences and sympathies to the families of those who, uh, of the, of the uh, prison officer who died and the prison staff that were injured. You know, and so the, the problem with the whole prison fire and jailbreak is that um, it's all been conducted in secrecy. And one of the issues of conducting public policy in secrecy, in spite of public criticism, has now become a defining characteristic feature of this government. And so they don't want you to know anything about what happened on that day. And so they've been very reticent. And, and I would say to you, since we last met here on the program, <clears throat> um, uh, almost, I think it was, what, uh, six days later, five days later, um, we were contacted by the um, minister, Ram Jatan. Uh, the party was contacted inviting us to a meeting on Saturday, that's July the 15th, to brief us on the crime, uh, on what happened at Camp Street Prison. And a delegation went to meet with Minister Ram Jatan and where there was the uh, chief of the prison, the chief of uh, the police, Asil Lal, and Mr. Samuels. And Ms. Minister David Patterson was there and apparently he chaired the meeting. So that there was some anticipation when we went to that, that a number of questions we had posed publicly um, in the media, and, and many of the questions were asked by almost everybody, that we would have some idea of you know, what had really happened. Um, and you will remember on this program, I asked about 22 questions, 22 plus questions to the minister. That's what we did the last program. And most of the, those have not been answered very few, one or two have been answered. So that there was some anticipation on, on, on Saturday morning that because this was a private briefing, briefing with the parliamentary opposition, that um, there'd be some forthcoming in a, in a confidential environment to speak to us. However, um, that didn't play out. So the government, you know, called Friday afternoon. We went Saturday morning early. The delegation went, that is. It was made up of minister, former minister, Rohi, former minister, Ed Hill, Bishop Ed Hill, um, Harry Gill, the, um, the M member of parliament for us, um, as well as Dr. Barry Ramshaw, a former minister of health. This was the delegation. Um, and so what happened at the meeting was that, you know, what was de what was said to us was what was already in the public domain. There was nothing new, and so our members started asking questions to minister and to the director of prisons and to the uh, commissioner of police. Unfortunately, um, the minister Ramjatan was getting a bit irate and upset because maybe, maybe who knows, the commissioner of police or. Uh, the director of prison may be saying more than what they wanted them to say, I don't know. But eventually uh, the minister said, well, these questions that are being asked will be answered when the president sets up a commission of inquiry into the prison jailbreak and the prison fire. And that was Saturday morning. At that point, the meeting closed. However, isn't it rather interesting that several days later, at a uh, the minister says, the same minister, Ramdutan says, that um, there will be no commission of inquiry into the jailbreak and into the fire until all the escapees are caught or captured. Now, isn't that an interesting comment by the minister? Why does it stop 
a commission inquiry being held, as the government seems to love commissions inquiries. We already have 15 that have been held and costing billions, million, hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even a billion by now, who knows? And so there will be no, so the questions we asked, which we were told, uh, you have to wait for a commission inquiry, these will be answered. Um, that was Saturday. On Wednesday, we hear the minister saying that no, 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 no. There'll be no commission inquiry until all the men are captured. So, we and you, the public, will continue to have to wait for some time indefinitely um, to have a commission inquiry or to have any investigation into what really transpired on July the 9th, July the 9th. What were the antecedents? What happened before? Were there indications before something was going to happen? And the questions we pose, the 22 questions we pose, and every day some new questions come up. Um, because in that meeting with Minister Amjatan, he said that the prison officers were locked in a room uh, when the fire was going on. Again, more questions. Sometimes when they open their mouth, we have more questions being added to our list of 20 odd questions. So, in that context, we responded to a request to meet with us. Unlike when we have asked, and the leader of opposition has asked to meet with the president after the second rejection, the first rejection of the list, and where he put forward the view that a person had to be a judge or with judge-like qualities to be considered by him from the list of six. And the, pres the leader of opposition, Mr. Jaglio, asked the president, let's meet, let's talk about the way in which we're both interpreting the Constitution, otherwise we need to go to the court. And that invitation or request by the leader of opposition was rejected by the president. And instead he said, let Basil Williams and whoever you want meet and discuss. And I've already reported to you on this program that all it all that happened was that uh, Mr. Williams just wanted us to put in writing what were our views on this. And that was it. There was no dialogue, no discussion. So isn't it funny, you know, when one reads the president's statement that's reported in the state media, no less, where he accused the parliamentary opposition of uncooperativeness to the level of being dysfunctional. And I'm quoting from him, quote, uncooperativeness to the level of being dysfunctional, quote, unquote, or an inflexible opposition as it relates to cooperating, engaging in talks. Interesting. <laughs> One, we know we live in the years of the age of technology and we can communicate by using our cell phones and WhatsApp and Facebook and so on. But that's not really what we're talking about when the parliamentary opposition constitutionally recognized, the leader opposition constitutionally recognized, has an engagement with the president, who is a constitutional post holder as well. It isn't about engaging in talks. What talks is he talking about, by the way? Where have we been invited to talks? And we'll come to that on the program a bit more. And of course, one of the reasons given in the state media for the president's comments on the opposition was that when he last addressed the parliament, for the fifth time, by the way, there's no president in the history of this country since we got independence and then later on as uh, 1970 when we became uh, a republic and uh, a republican hybrid Westminster system and then later more in 1980 constitution there is no president of Ghana ceremonial or otherwise executive as Mr. Granger is that has ever addressed uh, parliament in two and a half years five times more than what he's addressed the press or taken press conferences by the way but anyway um, and I remember this day it was in October last year and what was the dispute? Why did we not listen to him? That didn't mean we didn't listen to him. We did listen to him. We were in the lobby outside listening to the president speak. But we weren't physically in front of him, having sat several times and heard speeches that are very, very similar. But however, uh, why we were irate and upset about it was that it was our day. It was opposition day. And that we had to battle with the government to get a day that was suitable to us because I keep reminding you they have 33 people. Once someone's overseas, there can be no sitting in Parliament because then it would be 32-32. So they guard very much the day on which Parliament sits and that's why we only meet once a month because the chaps are flying around all over the place, aren't they? So here was a day was supposed to be our day, designated our day, and then we learn 
that the president's going to address the House on our day. We had business and a long agenda on the program. And in addition to that, the government had indicated that we would be finishing early because they had some big soiree that they had to attend. Uh, I can't remember Arthur Chung or one of those places. So we were very annoyed that our day was time was being eaten into. And we asked that the president's address come the day before. So we would come for the day before, listen to the president, and then come the next day for our program. Of course, all of that was denied. No, it cannot be. It has to be their way or no way. And so that was a context within which we decided we'd sit in the, lo in the MP's lounge, big screen up, and we'd listen to the president. And then, of course, the government brought a motion, which is normal, um, subsequently, to debate the president's contribution to the parliament, his, his statement to the parliament, which we debated for about seven, eight hours in a subsequent sitting. So it wasn't that we didn't pay attention to the, to the president, but I guess maybe he was very offended that we weren't physically sitting, listening, being lectured to by him in a context where it was our day. It was our day. And so one of the issues when the president makes his statement about inflexible uh, opposition and uncooperative to the level of dysfunctional, let's, let's talk about that a bit more today. Fundamental to cooperation and consensus building in anything, an organization, in a church, in a women's organization, in sports federations, in trade unions, and in government and with the opposition, any engagement where it takes two parties, not political parties necessarily, but two bodies or entities to engage with each other, even if it's internal within an organization. There have to be good faith efforts. You have to be coming with some good faith. And, I, and I'll give you an example of why we know what we're talking about, or we believe we know what we're talking about, and that is that in the 10th parliament, the PPP won the executive with 32 seats in parliament. There wasn't a combined opposition in the parliament. There were two separate parties, the APNU and AFC. APNU got 26 seats and, and AFC got seven seats, totaling 33. However, it wasn't clear at that time whether they would be oper operating in unison all the time and, and supporting each other. It wasn't clear. And so after the elections in 2011, President Ramatar met with the Mr. Granger and a delegation from the APNU and AFC. And that continued. And, and the, for example, the first thing was that was discussed was the issue of who would be the Speaker of the House. And we put forward Ralph Rampran, and they said, no, 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 we'll think about it. And there were several meetings, even on the day of Parliament itself, January the 10th, when we met in 20, uh, 2012 for the first time after the elections. We weren't clear what they were going to do. However, we put forward Ram, Ralph Ramkran, they voted it down, and they put forward Ralph, uh, uh, Raphael Trotman, and they gave the 33 seats, uh, votes to him. So engagements didn't start out on a good ground in the, after the 2011 elections. And in fact, there were more probably talks between the government and opposition throughout the 10th period, although a 10th parliament, although a short parliament in the sense it was not five years, it was three years. Discussions on the budgets, discussions post Linden, discussions on um, issues of Amila Falls, of the hydro projects, on Nissel and other projects that were going on, the anti money laundering and the amendment uh, bill that was brought by us, and what were the consequences to do with if FATF blacklisted us or grey list us. There were talks and talks, constant meetings, and I am talking with some authenticity because I was there. I was the official note, note taker in most cases and contributed to the discussions. So I, I kind of know what I'm talking about. So that how can the president talk about uncooperativeness to the point it is functional when it was under his leadership as leader the opposition in the 10th parliament that first of all, they blocked and vetoed $90 billion in two budgets. So the $90 billion that went for our Indian development and interior roads and a number of other projects just got cut out of the project, including the president's budget at the Ministry of the Presidency or the Office of the President. They cut out a mile, they cut out e-governance, they cut out money for the NCN, etc. And I could continue talking about it. So, good faith. This was also the opposition led by Mr. Granger that blocked the anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism amendment bill 
twice, twice. And so Ghana was greylisted by FATF and then they came along and they passed the bill with the amendments they wanted and so we were finally removed from the grey list. However, we haven't met all the we haven't met the conditions of FATF. And then of course they blocked the Amila hydro uh, electric hydropower project. And so three I'm just giving you three instances, three instances only. The Tenth Parliament is replete with instances of non-cooperation by the opposition to the point of being disruptive. And so they were able to block $90 billion that was meant for the development of this country. So let's, let's examine the President's statement even further. So we have a comparison of when he was the leader of the opposition. And I will say this, that I was President meetings where Mr. Ramatar, President Ramatar, is a very humble man, he's a very, he's a man that is open to dialogue, who would meet Mr. Granger, and Mr. Granger would say to the meeting, you know, we, and the, Mr. Jack Ramatar would say, well, you know, we're here to talk and let's see if we can find a solution. And I saw and I witnessed Mr. Granger saying, we're here to tell you what our position is. And this is our position. And that's it. We, our position is non-negotiable, in other words, that's what he was saying. And so there was no dialogue. It was basically saying to the president, here, this is what we want. You take it or leave it. And that was it. And we went on and on in that vein for what was two and a half years. So let's go back to his present statement of why he's saying we're not cooperative. The issue of his uh, non-attendance of his uh, speech in October, it is now July. So you're going to say that. Why you didn't say that in October? Why are you waiting until July to now make this a rationale for what? To the, the reason for what? Why we can't agree on GCOM chairman? Is this what it's all about? What is it about? So the first thing, and I want to remind you, at the very first sitting we attended, remember Parliament after the 2015 election, was convened, I believe, June the 10th, 2015. We didn't go for that. We didn't go for one in July. And then we didn't go to the third one when Minister Jordan read his first budget, 2015 budget. However, we went for the budget debate. So having heard and received uh, by the internet and so on the speech, we went into Parliament and on August the 17th, the first day, the debate on the 2015 budget commenced. And it is, it is during this sitting that the leading opposition, Barry Jack Dio, says that we will support any matters that will benefit our people and the nation and we will reserve the right to criticize matters which will hurt the people in the nation we will not be lectured we will not be silenced we will offer cooperation and on matters of the betterment of our people but we will fight against matters that hurt our people and the nation and this mantra, mantra is being repeated throughout from August 17, 2015 to up to July 7th. And the big debate on July 16th with the leading opposition speaking on petroleum and then being abused by Mr. Raphael Trump in the most unparliamentary language I've ever heard in the Parliament of Guyana. And I've been going to Parliament since, since 1977, although I wasn't a member until 1992. And the Speaker allowed it. And in fact, even went worse on the July 17th, 7th meeting when we complained about the Broom's uh, selfie in the chambers, the Boom Out thing and the attack on Jagdale and Raphael uh, Trotman's attack on Jagdale, the Speaker found it was all acceptable. So open sesame now in Parliament, I guess, that the kind of things that Jack, uh, Ramatar said of Jagdale, personal attack, um, well, open sesame. Let's see how the speaker deals if we were to dare to speak to the, op the government members with such language. We will see. Parliament isn't over. We have a couple more years now. So, and you will recall that there was one meeting in December 2015 between the leading opposition and the president. <clears throat> and in that meeting, the, pre the leading opposition, Mr. Jack Dew, publicly and in that meeting, officially gave its support to the government on Guyana's territorial sovereignty and controversy with the Guyana-Venezuela border. We said very clearly we were willing 
to, to work and collaborate on Guyana's territorial integrity and national sovereignty. This was not an issue that was controversial between the government and the opposition of Guyana. And in fact, what led to that after that meeting was the uh, parliamentary opposition invite, inviting, being invited to have one representative on what was Minister Greenwich's advisory committee on the border issue of Guyana-Venezuela. And so this is the only area of formal cooperation between the government and the opposition. The only one, the only one formal in which I am the representative of parliamentary opposition and I am one of 25 people who are part of this advisory group and we meet when it comes to the border issue if the UN representative is coming in and to talk about preparations for the dialogue with the UN representatives and this started uh, since um, 2016. So this is the only formal area of cooperation. At that same meeting with the President, he had talked about setting up other commissions and committees for possible collaboration between the government and the opposition. One was the Border and Security Committee, which we also accepted and felt that this was an, uh, uh, an important innovation or in, uh, move by the President and that we were willing to be part of that. And so we were told that uh, the president would be appointing that body uh, in the near future. Well, it is a year and a half, and we don't know if that body is set up or not, because the, the Security and Border uh, Committee was looking at all our borders, not just Venezuela. And so whether that committee or commission, whatever it's called, has been set up, we don't know. But we can say that we were never invited to, to be part of it unlike the one with Guyana, Venezuela, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. When we look at parliamentary life, and this, you know, 11th Parliament, its characteristics are bullyism and undermining of the standing orders, sheer bullyism. Not one amendment we brought, not one motion that we brought as an opposition, has been accepted, not one. And even those that were on curbing crime, which was debated, they voted against it. And this was in 2016. So as far as they're concerned, crime is not a problem. I don't know what they're saying now after the prison break, but they very clearly defeated that motion on crime. This is an issue that should be of common interest to the opposition and the, and the, and the government common interest that was defeated. Then again, another motion we brought on curbing suicide last year. This again we felt was an issue that could give some substance to the president's comments about working together. And so we brought a motion on, on, on curbing suicide in which we made a number of proposals of how we could work together and how diff the, the issue of reducing suicide, preventing it, could be an issue of a national issue and not a partisan issue. That was defeated too, defeated too. It is only last week that the chairman of the Social Services Sectoral Committee, Dr. Vindy Passad, with the UNDP and, and with the agreement of Mrs. Scotland, the speaker, were able to have a workshop on suicide prevention and by the way, the majority of the proposals we made in our motion were part of the discussions of that uh, workshop with parliamentarians. I want to see what the government's going to do now. So two, two issues I'm only giving you. The one on rice, they defeated as well, and we put forward proposals calling on the government, things they could do to relieve the issues of the, of the um, rice farmers. We tried to discuss the one on the closure of Wales. The speaker did not allow that. It was not allowed. So, and then all the issues we raised, our formal motions in Parliament, to give the government an out in a sense, uh, wasn't our intention to do that, but if the government was genuinely interested in reducing poverty and reducing the hardships on the Guyanese people, the motions we brought to remove the VAT that had been imposed on zero-rated items previously, that the the government 
uh, restore all the zero-rated items, of course, was defeated. And I can go on and on in that way about all the instances, all the suspension of motions by the Prime Minister to ram through bills in three stages when they're supposed to go through at least two stages, two different sittings, time factor, time uh, days and numbers of days that required in the standing orders. That's Parliament. And that's just maybe a little inkling of Parliament. And those who don't believe me, why don't you look at some of the debates in Parliament through live streaming of Parliament? They have sometimes the video in Parliament, although some of the debates, uh, speeches seem to be cut out. But you can look at the live streaming of the parliamentary sittings. But let's go to outside of Parliament. Where were these good faith efforts and collaboration? Let's talk about it. Budget talks in 2016 and 2015. Yes, we were invited to present our views and comments in relation to the budget prior to it being uh, laid in the House. To have an input, I assume. On both occasions, we said we were willing to do it, but we needed to have some base documents. So if you're unable to get base documents on economic performance, on taxation revenue, on indicators of how each sector is working in terms of the GDP, etc., then it's very difficult to have a discussion on the budget. You're talking about an opposition that was in, part, was in government for a long time, that understands how budgets are created and how it relates to the economy and how it's functioning. And also, an opposition that has economists there's not one economist on the other side except Mr. Greenwich, and he's in foreign affairs. Well, he has some knowledge of, of, of the economy. Mr. Jordan is not an economist. He's a finance person. And so there's not one economist in the entire government side, not at the minister level, not at the uh, backbenchers level, and, in the, and we don't see and notice anybody that is Minister Jordan seems to accompany himself with. So how do we take part in a discussion when data, information is not shared? So how do you plan a budget and look at the numbers if you're not aware of what the numbers are? Then we're just putting up a wish list. And we said, no, we're not in the game of wish lists. We want to make a meaningful contribution. Therefore, there's certain documents or data we need to have access to. So I wasn't allowed. So those on both occasions, um, we were not encouraged, actually. If you really want us to participate, then you would be more forthcoming with information, wouldn't you think so? Well, the second one, the sugar industry. Now, sugar industry. They had a commission of inquiry on Gaisuko that we demanded that it be tabled in the House. It was tabled in the House. We said we should debate it. That wasn't allowed. But the commission of inquiry on sugar said they should be not close any estate, that it was f should not be done. The, the consequences would be catastrophic. They have parked the commission inquiry. However, what is interesting is that a year and a half after, after the Wales estate, sorry, uh, uh, half a year after Wales estate is closed, almost a year and four months after the commission inquiry, is uh, on Gaisuko is made public. Then we have, we then we learn that in fact, all discussion on sugar was just academic. Because in fact, long before, the government had approached a gentleman called Mr. Curtin to already start, to proceed to start putting and here I'll quote from it. It's in November 16, 2016. It's a document signed by Minister of State, Joseph Harmon. And it authorizes Mr. Brian Wesley Curtin to, quote, engage in discussions on its government's behalf with interested companies, parties regarding their possible interests in acquiring the Guyana Sugar Corporation in whole or in part and, end quote, and to facilitate arrangements for negotiations. So here it was that Wales was being closed, and that was announced um, early in January 2016, that it would close at the end of December 2016. 
2016. And here is a government in November 2016 hiring someone to be there negotiating to search for people to buy Gaisuko. But it is not known until this year that the government intended to put out Enmore, Iflat, Rose Hall, and that it would privatize Skeldon. And yet they're saying to us that we're not we're not cooperating. In fact, you will you may recall that the opposition was called on the last the second to last day of the year 2016 to come to urgent meetings on December 31st in relation to sugar, as it was urgent the government had to act urgently. Our people went. So did Gao, so did I think Nasi and others. Gao put forward his views in writing in the early part of 2017. But at no point did the government want to hear anything that the PPP had to say. It was all about going to the meeting and being lectured to by the ministers there about what is and what would happen. There was no opening for looking for anything new. And the proof of that is that in June, the Minister of Agriculture, Minister Noel Hall, tables something called a state paper on sugar in the Parliament. It's a tiny little booklet that basically repeats all that we've been hearing in the press with nothing new. And so why are we supposed to be part of this charade? Because it is a charade. It's not about sitting and engaging in real terms. You know, it's like being married to a guy and he says, you know, you can have your own opinion, darling, but I rule the roost at the end of the day. I'm the husband, I make the decisions. And so the wife can decide, is that what her life is going to be, just a decoration, or is she going to have a voice, and is that voice going to be heard? It's so that in engagements in politics too. Politics is about and engagements between political parties, particularly governments and opposition, is about agreeing to disagree sometimes. Compromising where each gets a little bit of something they want, but they don't all get what they want. The government has no such attitude in relation to, you know, in relation to any kind of, uh, of real engagement with the government, with uh, opposition. And then, of course, we can go on about the government's attitude to civil society, not only us. That you have a lineup of organizations, civil society bodies, including the miners, GGDMA, private sector, all these people lining up to meet with the president, including the National Two Shows Council, that had to wait for six, eight months to meet with the president, and only because of the motion we brought in Parliament that was on the Commission of Inquiry on Lands. But this government cannot, does not know how to engage with people who may have a different opinion. And I'm saying to the APNU AFC supporters, be careful, because when a government is so intolerant of views that are other than theirs, and in fact becomes vindictive on how it treats with the opposition or civil society people, and only wants their own the politically correct of the elector of the political director to this country, watch out the supporters who voted for APNO AFC, the people at the lower levels, because if they're so intolerant of what are constitutional provisions, be careful when you yourselves, as supporters, genuine supporters of APNO AFC, voted down the line, still hope and believe in the APNO AFC coalition government. Be careful when you decide that there's certain things you don't like, that you don't agree with, and how will you be treated as persons who also have a voice. So that's sugar, civil society. And then we have the next issue, the big elephant in the room, and that is the appointment of the chairman for GCOM. You know the story, we submitted two lists in keeping with the constitutional provisions. The president has rejected both. It is now nine months that GCOM has no chair, no commission functioning, because it can't function without a chair. And so the GCOM and its machinery is not being monitored by the commission for the last nine months. Mr. Gaskin, a gentleman called Marcel Gaskin, who I believe is related to the Minister of Business, Dominique Gaskin, went to the court 
on the interpretation of the Constitution with regards to Article 161, which says how the uh, list of names are brought up, how the role of the President, the role of the Lady Opposition, and stipulates how all this takes place. The opposition, PBPC, was listed as one of the persons that would have to come before the court to answer on the issues. The Chief Justice met on this issue for quite a while and ruled, and her ruling vindicated the position taken by all of those in the parliamentary opposition and other civil society and legal practitioners who did not agree with the president's interpretation that it had to be a judge or person with judge-like um, qualities, could not be fit and proper, could only be a judge. And um, so she ruled, she vindicated us on these positions. And let me read a section of what I, I, we understand from the press are the issues that she ruled on. She ruled to clarify the following constitutional issues because what was taken was a constitutional motion for to interpret the Constitution, Article 161. That the list of names which is to be submitted by the Lady Opposition to the President for the appointment of a Chairman of a Commission can, 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 can comprise of judges, former judges, any person qualified to be a judge, or any other fit and proper person. Number one. Number two that there is no preference of one category over another. Three, that any person from any of each of the categories can be appointed, that is a judge, a person eligible to be a judge, or any other fit and proper person. That the list can consist of six judicially or legally qualified persons or six fit and proper persons. That there's no requirement that a judicially qualified person must be on the list. That any fit and proper person must have characteristics of honesty, integrity, impartiality, and independence from political or other control. Listen carefully. That the president is obliged to provide reasons for deeming each of the six names on the list submitted to him as unacceptable. So in other words, he can't reject all six people without saying, I don't like X, I don't like Y, for the following reasons. And it must be, must do that. None of that has happened with the 12 names. That the Constitution com contemplates only one list that can be amended with names added or removed from it. So in other words, we submitted one list and we've added and amended to another six names. And we're now going into another amendment of the first list with six more names. That the president's actions and decisions are justiciable in a court of law. So the issue that was taken that the, the president doesn't have an answer to a court of law is not true. That the finding by the president that one name is unacceptable does not render the entire list unacceptable. So in other words, he's got a list of six names. He had said that unless he accepts all six names, he will not consider any of those six names. The court is saying that he, one name being acceptable or five names that are acceptable does not mean that the entire list is unacceptable. That so long as a single name is acceptable to the president, he ought to appoint that person. All of these issues the Chief Justice has ruled on, vindicates our position that we've been arguing since January this year. And so the fact that the Chief Justice added an opinion on a matter that was not before the court, that is in relation to Article 162, does not distract from her ruling on Article 161, which was what went to the court. Now. Surprise, surprise. What is the president's reaction to the Chief Justice ruling? He said in the media yesterday, and it's, it's in the press today, that the Chief Justice gave an opinion based on her perception of the law. And I will continue to act within my perception of the Constitution. Whoa, 
Wait, guys. Wait, wait, wait. Am I reading this? Is it true? I'll read it again. And I'm quoting from the newspapers, from the state media. So it's not Gail DeJay make up this story. Quote, the Chief Justice gave an opinion based on her perception of the law. And I, meaning I, President Granger, will continue to act within my perception of the Constitution. Woo! Now that is a shocker. Does the, real, the president really realize what he said? Does he totally comprehend the impact of what he's saying and the consequences of what he's saying? Let's go. It seems as if that the president seems to think that the court ruling, that's fine, but I will continue on my own way. Remember the separation of powers. Government is made up of three branches. The executive, meaning the cabinet and the government, the legislature, parliament, what we call parliament, and legislature, and the judiciary. They are all separated and have checks and balances on each other. So the executive makes their decisions, but they are checked by the judiciary and they're checked by the legislature. The legislator is, legislature is not supposed to make pronouncements and decisions that would impact on the constitution and rights of this country and the people's rights. Judiciary is there as the gatekeeper, the custodian of the constitution of our country. There is no other body, institution in our country that can rule on the constitution, interpret it, other than the judiciary. So unless the president is saying, I'm going to go now and appeal the chief justice ruling and take this matter higher up and eventually to the Caribbean Court of Justice, Madam Chief Justice, in her ruling on the article to do with the selection of the chairman of the GCOM is the ruling. And it is important that the president abides with the ruling. Because the judiciary is a check on government. The judiciary is a check on the legislature and on the executive. It is a separation of powers. And so it is inconceivable that a head of state will very casually, almost cavalierly, kind of say to the Chief Justice, who, by the way, he appointed as the acting Chief Justice, it was his selection that he now says, that's fine, she can have her opinion, but I will keep mine. So in other words, he's flaunting the judiciary. If he doesn't agree with the decision, he has an out. All he has to do is appeal her decision and let it go further up the judiciary until it reaches the Caribbean Court of Justice. That's how you deal with differences of opinion. But the problem with this government is that, you know, this is the same president, by the way, that says that the opposition is uncooperative to the point of being dysfunctional. But, but when he disobeys and disregards the ruling of a chief justice acting, who I said he chose, and then fundamentally is rejecting the decision that was not in his favor, then what is that saying about inflexibility and lack of corporateness to the point of dysfunctional? I think he's talking about the government, not about us in the parliamentary opposition. I think those statements were meant about the APN, APNU AFC coalition government. But isn't this attitude and of this government typical? I am shocked by his statement, but when I reflect on it, really I'm not that shocked. Because there's a legacy, there's now a pattern of behavior of this government that is undemocratic. That attitude is one that you take it our way or you don't, there's nothing. So it is about bullyism. There is no way except if it's their way. 
And so when the government says, you know, the opposition is being inflexible and uncooperative, I believe fundamentally that the president would expect that the parliamentary opposition, whether it's PVP or somebody else, must be present and sit very politely because this is a militaristic attitude to people. Know your place. Your commander is there. Listen to him. Salute at the right time and say, yes, sir. No, sir. But don't question anything. And so, and, and so the government wants an opposition that's going to go politely to parliament and to wherever he wants them sit politely and listen to them abuse the PPP and abuse Jagdeo and demonize Jagmer in public forums on issues that are unrelated to what they say they're launching or carrying on with and that we must sit there politely and nod because you know the emperor is present it's an attitude that's dangerous and so <coughs> the government wants a polite opposition, just like in the May Day. It is, it is Mr. Trotman who said, Raphael Trotman, former speaker, Minister of Natural Resources, who spoke on behalf of the President at May Day. I was there. When, what did he call for? He called for the trade unions of Ghana to fully, fully support the initiatives of the government. Now, seriously, Trade unions and governments naturally have a friction, naturally, because they're representing different interests sometimes. There's always a friction between trade unions and government. Doesn't matter which one, which country you're looking at. It's how they resolve the differences that's important. And what's the attitude of the government and the attitude of the trade unions. And so it's not just about the parliamentary opposition. There's this attitude that is inflexible and intolerant of different views and that only selecting people who are like-minded, who never say never and never question what is being done by the government. And so the bottom line is that there's no good, good faith efforts on the part of this government, none. Bottom line is, it is their way, and that's the only way. And so that's the attitude we're dealing with. And let me warn you before we close, because today I haven't been able to deal with, have you have your call in. Let me warn you, the viewers. We've seen recently that they advertise for the Chancellor and Chief Justice and they announced recently that they've now finished the interviews, the panel, and they have the two names of the Chancellor and the Chief Justice. However, in the constitutional reform process in 1999-2001, because the then opposition wanted power sharing and inclusivity in governance, the constitution was amended that the appointment not the acting appointment, the appointment of a chancellor and appointment of a chief justice requires meaningful consultation between the president and the leading opposition and the constitution defines what meaningful consultation is and requires that the leading opposition agrees, concurs, that they reach agreement on the names. And that's why under Jack Deo, the many attempts with Corbyn to have Chancellor Carl Singh acting and, Chance and Chief Justice Ian Chang acting, that they be confirmed, their appointments be confirmed, were denied all the time because Mr. Corbyn, as leader of the opposition, refused to agree. And so I'm predicting, watch, watch carefully the appointment of the Chancellor and the, and the Chief Justice in this country. Watch carefully. Because if the President does not adhere to the Constitution of Guyana, on the issue of the appointment of these two people, be careful. We are going down a really slippery road in relation to democracy in our country. We've already had many warning signs, including the recent statement to do with the Chief Justice ruling on GCOM. So we're coming to a close. The technician does may have one minute left. 
I apologize that we haven't been able to have discussions uh, this sitting, but they're very important issues that we need to look at, especially in terms of the fundamental issues of democracy. And so, you know, you have a blessed week, and we'll see each other next Thursday between 12.30 and 1.30. Please, as always, remember, don't drink and drive. Take your time. It's okay. You know, there's an, a life is much more important than getting to a place two minutes earlier than you should have, and so or than you plan to. And let me finally say what I usually quote to you over and over again, but I want you, I think it's important. And struggle, we shall. And silent, we shall not be. Silence is the greatest enemy of democracy. Silence makes those in power think they can get away with anything. Silence helps those who want more control and less democracy, those who want to move this country to a police state. And so, and on and the next elections, the people will make their votes count again, and there will be a change, and we in the People's Progressive Party, Civic, shall be the government. And we shall have to start all over again, as in 1992, to reconstruct, to put this economy back on a firm and stable footing, and restore the programs which help the poor and the vulnerable, and those at risk, and restore the independence of the judiciary and the legislature from executive interference." End quote. Those are my words. So you have a great week. You take care of each other. Take care of your homes. Be careful. There seem to be a lot of fires going on. Make sure everything's turned off and that you're being very, very fire conscious because there seems to be quite a lot of fires and, and we're very sorry about those who have lost their properties and homes and the trauma of all their personal possessions. And so take care. A lot of rain coming down, so watch for floods and protect your families always. Have a good weekend and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye-bye. Ta-ta.